Hey everybody, welcome to another video here on the Blue Abroad YouTube channel. We're doing, I guess we're doing analytics corner again. That's what this is, Pom. This is the it's return back. of analytics corner. It's back. We're back looking at stats, data, and and telling the story of, of what we see. And this in this video, we're going to talk about Sam Walsh. And it, it's almost weird because you, like when people ask, like, who's your favorite player? And it's like, oh, besides Walsh, it's kind of like, we're dismissing him like he's a 15-year champion that goes without saying. But such is the reputation that he has built for himself um, in, in three seasons. And I guess now that we have three full seasons of, of data, I thought it would be a cool exercise to have a look at, first of all, his third season. And then have a look at where it ranks amongst the other greats of the game, let's say in the modern era, um, in the midfield. And, and just sort of, then we'll look a little bit at, as to where he can improve and we'll also look at what a projection of his peak looks like so start us off this is his third year what happened well i mean it was the total season on it from sammy i mean we've we, we've craved a bit of positivity in the last 10 years and i think walsh has brought that hasn't he i mean we've been talking about our youth but we we won the lottery getting pick one this year didn't we we, we that year when he came through the draft, look at the numbers, just below 30, 4.5 tackles, just under five clearances. And he even added a few goals this year, which was the big question mark. If you remember old Kane Corns, he was saying that, oh, he's not a goal kick in mid. That's why Rose is the best in the draft. He added that this year. As remember the famous, fuck yeah, we Absolutely. know what Walsh can do. We know what Walsh can do. And, he finished top 20 in nearly every category. A lot of top fives, a lot of top tens in the midfield department. He really announced himself. I think this is the, no one's talked about it. He has announced himself as one of the best midfielders in the comp now. Made the All-Australian. This guy is now in there with your McRae's, your Bontepelli's, your Trakers, your Olivers. And I don't think anyone's talked about it. It's kind of been forgotten about and expected, but that's a huge achievement in the end of year three. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think what constantly is the theme, and I, I think this is one of the ultimate forms of compliment when people talk about league-wide, they talk about the work rate, his work rate. And it's 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 not talking about his X factor or his talent. Now, he's obviously talented, but all draftees are talented. It's, it's the work rate which separates him amongst the rest. And the thing is, this is coming from footballers who play in the same league who also do a lot of hard work. But for them to be able to put their own you know, ego to the side and admit, nah, this guy works harder than me or the next person, I think is a, is a testament to him. And I think yeah, when we look at these numbers in his third season, he's obviously very durable as well. And he's consistent. He's, I think that you know, everyone has a down game here and there. The, the, the worst game I think he played in... 2021 was probably against the GWS Giants. Matt DeBoer, who's a great tagger, was on him. He still had 20. He still finds a way. And he, he's always find that with the greats, their, 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 uh, their floor is very high. Like their ceiling is obviously high, but their floor is very high. And so that's where you get that consistency from. And I mean, we just need him to stay healthy and keep working hard. And, and uh, I think we'll touch on that a little bit later in this video. But I wanted you to go through some of the greats of the modern era, because that's that's always the comparison. I don't believe you can compare Walsh to anyone in his draft, personally. I mean, the AFL are already starting to bring out this Darcy Parish sam Walsh comparison. I mean, they're three years apart. So let's look at the greats of the modern era and where he stacks up. Let's start with, uh, with Joel Selwood. There's some good names here as well. I mean, yeah. Joel Selwood is probably... In, in, in a way, I'd say, and I know some people will disagree with this, but was supreme. When Joel Salwood came through Geelong at this point in time, they had a cracking team, but Joel Salwood was that young kid that was making things happen. That, that was their Sam Walsh, the kid they were getting excited about. There was Gaz there as well, but this kid here was something special. And I see a lot of similarities between a young Joel Salwood and Sam Walsh. The leadership ability the ability to do things that a kid shouldn't do and really starting to surpass the guys who are meant to be teaching him and really becoming the teacher himself. Great year for Joel Selwood as well. 27.5 touches, 
4.7 tackles, just under four clearances. And again, one of the question marks about Joel Selwood has always been he doesn't kick enough goals because that is the, the niche in the AFL. If you're a go- yeah. midfielder, you have to kick a goal a game. But this guy has had a tremendous career. It might call him a ducker, but at the end of the day, he's had a phenomenal career and he will be go down as one of the greats of this these last couple of decades. Yeah, I, I think the obviously the, the key difference is that, I mean, Selwood played for a premiership team. He came into a, a team that was at the top of their game contending for premierships. I think out of, I mean, we're going to get to Penderbury in a moment, but I think Selwood is very much a, um, a good comparison in that third year. Next up is is God himself, Gaz, in his third season. Now, Gary, obviously, he came on a little late. He took a little bit longer to blossom. It didn't happen straight away for him. But this is where he was in his third year, right? Yeah, so they kind of deployed him more on the half-forward line. He was, he was the opposite of Walsh. They kind of knew he had the ability to kick goals and he was learning his craft off the half-forward. But... This guy is something else. Like, honestly, he's he, he is a genius. 18.2 touches, 3.6 tackles, even mixed in with the clearances, over a goal a game. I mean, Gary Abler is a once-in-a-lifetime type footballer. But someone, I think, that when you watch Walsh, particularly this year, who had a lot more time on the half-forward, don't want to get too exciting, but that, that goal he kicked that we mentioned at the start of the video where he used the profanity... That was Ablett-like in, in in no space. That goal where he chases down the tackle, spills the ball and then kicks the goal, doesn't give up. That is Gary Ablett. That is what Gary Ablett no, is known for, his ability to never say never, his work weight, his intensity. And then he had to adapt once the injuries came. That is what Ablett used to do. If you go back and watch mid is Geelong, what Walsh did with these goals this year was Sam Walsh. That's what Gary Ablett did. He used to chase things down. He used to make things happen. And that's something that I think excites me that Walsh can add that to his repertoire. And I wouldn't be surprised to see is a goal a game footballer. Yeah. I'm going to be interested to watch, you know, Sam over the next five years and and then compare him to Ablett as a midfielder. Because obviously Ablett was a guy that could just get you 35 any given week. So that that's really the one for me. I, I You know, year three, it, I guess it's just showing how developed Sam Walsh is in year three against Gary Ablett. But we do know that Gary Ablett goes on to to reach crazy heights. Um, the next one is, is Chris Judd. Now, this was a Brownlow medal season at 21 years of age. And um, I think Walsh had the same amount of votes as what Chris Judd did in 2004. And unfortunately, he didn't win the Brownlow uh, this year. But... This, this was Juddy. This was really the coming out party. He, he just burst onto the scene with West Coast and, and really took the competition by storm with that pace and explosiveness. I, I think these are two players that... There's always an argument with, with Carlton players because Carlton are rubbish. Their numbers are warped. Now, yeah. I think that that's maybe true in the back line. You could argue that, that you're going to get more opportunities for intercept marks. I think in the midfield, when you look at what Judd was playing with, he had Kerr. Cousins, the pretty good footballers. Do you know what I mean? They're, like, Carlton have really Crips and some random guys that they've thrown around him for the la- for two years. This year, maybe he's had a bit more talent, you could argue. This year, he's going to go in with a lot more talent. But really, Walsh had to hit the ground day one and be very good. Chris Judd had some superstars around him. But look at these numbers and then just remember Walsh's numbers. And let it sink in that this is one of the guys who, at the time, people were talking about could be the best ever in 2004. There was talk that Judd could be the best ever. And just look at Walsh's numbers. They're not far off. And he's playing for a team that, to be honest, he hasn't really got much help. Everything's hard. It's very true. It's just so funny how the game changes and what a, a Brownlow medal season looks like you know, um, in oh, 2004. I, I mean, that they're the kind of numbers we're hoping Dow gets. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, and, and imagine if Dow did them numbers, people would probably complain about it. But at the time, Judge was regarded as potentially the best ever to play the game. The best thing we'd ever seen, yeah. There. It's true. 
The final one is, is Scott Pendlebury, which obviously he was one that was able to really win a lot of ball early on. And and this was his third season. I think it's not so different to Selwood in a way and then their ability to, to win the ball. Yeah, and I think if you look at Sam Walsh, um, Pendlebury for me has an uncanny gift that only Gary Ablett, who we've mentioned, has. And that is the ability to seem to be stood still while everyone else is running around. He's never rushed. Pendlebury is one of, I hate to say it, he's a pie, but he is one of my favourite players to watch, especially yeah. at the ground, because this guy looks like he could find space in a crowded elevator. Like, he's never going to get COVID because he's he, he thinks too quick. Like, this guy finds that gap. And I think, perfect example here for Walsh, because Walsh does the same. There was times this year I've watched Walsh, and he's surrounded, but he's not rushed. He does two little moves. He finds the gap, makes the handball, and he's out. And that's Pendlebury-like. And I think Pendlebury's a great comparison to him because a young guy who's had to take on a leadership role, who has been in good teams, bad teams, but always performed. And Pendlebury is, I'd say out of all this list, the most consistent performer, the guy yeah. that really hits his numbers all the time. And that's something that Walsh has got. And I think Walsh, if he looked at this video he should be presently surprised that he's probably got pieces of all of these. It's almost like someone's gone away in a, in a lab and said, well, we'll give you Pendlebury's consistency in time. We'll give you Gary Ablett's creativity on the forward line. We'll give you Selwood's accumulation, Judd's ability to break from contests. He's kind of the hybrid of all of them. Yeah. And I mean, I think also, I mean, I'll just put here where, you know, his areas of improvement. Um, but I think, I mean, he is filling out pretty quickly his body hasn't really filled out just yet, and he's already got a pretty decent level of strength. So I think when we talk about you know where he can improve, I think when you talk about the build of his body, it's only going to help him personally, right? Oh, definitely. And I, th I think the big one for me is he's had more shots at goal this year than he's ever had. Um, still below average, though, compared to all the other midfielders for time in the forward half. Carlton predominantly do pull him back and want him there on, on the transition. They want that ball going to him. And that I think that's one of the things that no one talks about why he goals out one goal a game. His conversion as well, he's having a lot of... He does miss quite a bit on the run. That's probably an area that I think the last one is the big thing, the team around him. Yeah, Once yeah. that team starts to get better and he doesn't have to do as much and he can be more creative and we can have that Gold Coast moment when Gary Ablett was unplayable at times where we just let him do what he wants and just say, off you go. And you look at Traker now, you look at Martin when he's playing well, Bailey Smith when he's playing well, that's the role they're given. Just go out there. Just we'll do the hard work. You just find the ball. And that is, I think, when you'll see Walsh reach levels that I don't think this is anywhere near his level is what I'm saying. I think people think he's good now. I think in five years' time, you'll look back and be like, ah, oh, 30 touches a week, Mickey Mouse. He's yeah, that good. There was this notion that, I don't know if it came from AFL media or whatever it was, there was this notion that he he he's a player that hits his ceiling really early and stays consistent with it, um, and he can't really get much better than this. Like I said before, once that body fills out, you know, once the strength in the legs comes even more than what it was, like at the moment, it's almost like he's mentally willed himself to this level. His body's really catching up to what it is now able to do. And that's the exciting thing. So when we look at the trajectory of what we've seen in three seasons and we try and project what it could look like, this is what we get, right? So talk us through his peak, potential peak. Well, you're talking that, Walsh, a good thing to notice about Walsh is why, how he's got such high numbers. Is 2020, the big question mark last season just gone before the last, was he's tackling. Oh, he's not tackling, he's losing tackles. This year, they jumped up to 4.5, almost one of the highest on Carlton's list. Goals, first year, doesn't kick enough goals. He doubled his goals this year. He seems to have an uncanny knack. Of, and we heard it from Diesel when we interviewed him on the, one of the episodes with Riley, that he's annoying at training. He's like, these are my numbers. These need to improve. How do I do it? 
that is the understated thing about Walsh. Walsh will be watching these type of things, probably doing what I've done and gone, right, okay, cool. 29.5, I need 30 touches. How do I get that 0.5? And look at these numbers. These are 2023, where usually the midfielders in their fifth, sixth season are reaching their height, are reaching yeah. where they were born to be. 32.5 touches, five tackles, 5.5 clearances. And if he gets over a goal a game, this, I know people always say keep it in check with Walsh. I disagree. Walsh is a guy that I could probably build a gold statue out of and it wouldn't affect his arrogance. I don't think he's that type of player. I think yeah. you can throw all the kudos on him. You can throw abuse at him. I think he's like Tiger Woods, insular and selfish in his motivation. He doesn't care. And yep. I think this is huge. This is what we could be looking at. A Look at the numbers. Well, wow. a midfielder that can kick 20 goals in a season. I mean, we, we can't even get a second forward in 2021 to kick, uh, you know, 20 goals in a season almost. It's been a while. It's been a while. And yeah, I think I think probably, you know, obviously wishing good health and, and nothing like that. Anything can happen around the corner. And obviously with a compromised-ish league with restrictions and, and whatnot, um, you never know what's around the corner. But based on what we've seen so far, this is... I mean, this is exciting. And, and like you said, he, he's never really been one to let it all get to him and, uh, you know, let that entitlement creep in. I think that's what makes him so special. He stays humble. He stays hungry. And, and that's a real testament to him and his character and his, and his family, his parents, and the way he was brought up. So, you know, it's, it's all the kudos deserved. And you just know that a lot more hard work is coming because he's, got, he's, got so, he's still got some room for growth. Yeah, I mean, I can remember being with my grandfather against Bolton and watching Ronaldo make his debut. And I remember that 20 minutes I watched him, I, I had that epiphany that I was watching someone that I will tell my grandkids about. And I get that with Walsh. From the minute he walked into this league, I was watching someone that I know in 40 years' time, someone who's not born yet is going to PM me and be like, oh, what was Walsh like to watch? Was he really as good as my dad says? And you're saying the guy was a freak. Mm -hmm. This guy is a freak. And I think we are in a privileged position. Darcy Paris is his comparison, as we talked off camera, about we'll be like Darcy Parrish who? Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Well, the body of work is stacking up and we're excited to see what's to come. What about you? Let us know what you thought about the video, the development, maybe somebody else that you see his game comparable to I know Dangerfield's obviously in there as well uh, in, in another way but uh, we'll chat about it in the comments and go from there <laughs>